Welcome back. I'm Greg Caparaso. This is part two of my biological information lecture for fundamentals of bioinformatics. In this lecture, we're going to continue talking about numerical systems, but we're now going to think about base four systems, and we're going to talk about how that relates to how proteins are encoded in DNA. In our last lecture, we talked primarily about binary numbers. Um, so, for example, um, uh, systems that would use binary numbers would use would only have access to the two digits zero and one. And we talked about how sequences of symbols of, uh, in this binary system could be used to encode messages using the ASCII scheme. Um, and so, for example, a seven bit message um, or a binary number that is seven digits long, um, such as one zero zero, one zero zero zero, we looked up in an ASCII table and we determined that this represented the character H. Um, we use a similar approach like this to decode some messages. Um, so in this, uh, in this lecture, I want to talk about how um, uh, organisms use their DNA to encode information. And we're going to be primarily focusing here on um, simple protein coding regions in DNA. Um, so I'll come back to this at the end, but this is a simplification of how information is stored in DNA sequences. We're focusing on a very specific system, the encoding of proteins in a protein coding sequence, um, and even more specifically in an exon. We're not going to be thinking about introns here. Um, okay, so as you probably know, um, in DNA we have access to um, four bases, and these are A, C, G, and T. Um, and so these are chemical compounds um, that we uh, abbreviate with these, um, but respectively, these are adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. Um, and so when we represent this information on a computer, um, because there's only these four chemical compounds that make up DNA, we just refer to them simply as A, C, G, and T. And so like a binary system where we might have um, access to just two characters, um, in a base four system, we have access to these four characters. Um, and now these are um, in their most easily decipherable um, situation, these are going to be used to <clears throat> encode protein sequences. Um, and the uh, protein alphabet, say, that most organisms use um, uh, includes 20 amino acids. And so those 20 different amino acids or chemical compounds um, and those are combined in different sequences to create the variety of proteins that most organisms, uh, uh, most organisms use. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so if there's 20 amino acids and our DNA needs to be able to instruct a ribosome on how to construct a protein that is composed of these 20 amino acids in a certain sequence, and we have four bases that we can use to encode those, we're gonna need some combination of these bases to encode all 20 amino acids. <clears throat> this is similar to the ASCII system, um, for example, where we had two, ba uh, two digits, zero and one, and we want to encode 128 different messages. So there's 128 characters in the ASCII table that we're looking at. And so we used seven binary digits to encode those 128 characters. Um, so clearly, if we have four bases, we can't encode 20 amino acids in that. The most that we could encode would be four amino acids. Um, so what if we constructed two base messages? Um, and so, for example, let's say we tried to use the following messages. 
So those are all of the possible messages that we can encode with two bases of information. And just to be clear what I'm showing here, um, these are our two base messages. I just wanted to uh, separate those out for you. Um, also note, I'm talking about DNA here. Um, this would be analogous if we were talking about RNA. So if this were RNA, um, whoops. If this were RNA, we'd be looking at ACG and U, since uracil uh, replaces thymine in RNA. Um, <clears throat> okay, so now what do we have here? We have four times four. We have 16 different possible messages that we could encode here. 16 is still less than the 20 amino acids that we need to encode. Um, and so we clearly need more than uh, just two bases um, to uh, two bases to make up each of these individual components of the message that we're trying to send. So um, if we so the pattern that is emerging here is similar to what we saw with binary numbers. So remember with binary numbers, um, with two, uh, sorry, with one digit, we could just encode two messages. With two digits, we could encode four messages. With three digits, we could encode eight messages. Um, and so the pattern was, that we came up with um, was basically two to the n, um, where n is the number of places and two is the number of symbols that we have um, in our system or in our alphabet, depending on how you want to think about that. Um, and so for a base four system, um, four is the number of symbols. And if we use one place, then we can encode four messages. If we use two places, that's the table that I just drew out, and so we would have 16 messages. And if we were to continue this, um, say four to the three, so what if we use three places here? We would end up with 64 messages, potential messages. So 64 is greater than 20, of course, um, and so that would allow us to encode all 20 of the amino acids um, in a sequence of three DNA bases or RNA bases. Now that's more than 20 um, and so we have um, we have some room there we can encode more messages than we need to um, but there's no intermediary ground here so we can't for example talk about 2.5 bases of DNA that's not a meaningful quantity and so we have a few messages to spare um, so amino acids in protein coding sequences are in fact coded by three nucleotide bases and those three base messages are referred to as codons the mapping of codons to amino acids is referred to as the genetic code. So this table that I have up on the screen is an illustration of the genetic code. And in this case, it's illustrating the mapping of RNA sequences. And you can tell they're RNA because they contain U instead of T, but it's the mapping of RNA to, uh, codons to the amino acids that they represent or that they encode for. Um, and so the, um, for example, this is telling us that the codon UUU encodes for the amino acid phenylalanine. Um, and phenylalanine, PHE, is represented in a three character code here. Um, there's also, you may see um, just single character codes um, and so I believe, um, I think phenylalanine might be the code F because um, proline is P, um, but uh, this is just one way of representing the, uh, the amino acids is with these three letter codes. Um, and so now if we wanted to um, try and decode DNA messages in the same way that we encode 
uh, that we um, looked at RNA messages, or sorry, um, that we looked at binary messages um, encoded in ASCII, we could decode RNA messages that are encoding proteins using this genetic code. This happens to be the vertebrate genetic code, and so this is um, the mapping of codons to amino acids that happens in our bodies. Um, and for the most part, this is the same across all organisms, though there are some differences um, in uh, organisms that are very distantly related to us. Um, and so, for example, this is a sequence that we might want to um, decode using the genetic code. And so I'm just going to take a minute and I'm going to write this out in my notebook. And I encourage you to work along with this exercise. So maybe just pause the video for a minute and write that uh, sequence down yourself. Um, and so when I write this down, initially this looks um, pretty pretty challenging to map this onto the genetic code. And so the first thing I like to do um, when I am doing this with a pen and paper is just to indicate where my codons are. Um, and so I'll do that by just putting some blue lines in here. And this is purely just to help me um, identify what the codons are. Um, so now if I look at the genetic code table, I can look for the symbol AUG, and I can see that that shows up um, and illustrates to me that it encodes for the amino acid MET, or methionine. If I continue to work through this, the next one is UAU, um, which I can see from this table encodes for the amino acid TYR, tyrosine, um, GAG, um, let's see, where is that in the table? Um, a handy way to use this um, is um, you can see, like, you can look up the first letter on the left, the second letter on the top, and then the third letter over on the right. And so that can allow me to quickly find GAG, um, which encodes for GLU, which I believe is glutamic acid. Um, and I'm just going to keep working through these. So GGU codes for GLY, ACU, looking that one up, encodes for THR, AAU, codes for ASN, and UAA. Uh, is an interesting one. So you see, if I look that one up, it just says stop. And so what that means is that that's a stop codon. That encodes that we have reached the end of the message. Um, and this is possible because like we said, there are more, we can encode for more messages than there are amino acids. And so you see in this table that there's actually three stop codons. And so when I'm decoding this, um, this is obviously, you know, this would be a very short protein, much smaller than we would observe in nature, but useful for this exercise. Um, you can see I don't put anything down when I get to that stop codon. Um, that just indicates that we have reached the end of the message. Um, okay, so the um, there's a couple of um, there's a couple of uh, well, there's one thing that you should know that we should notice right now. Um, in addition to a stop codon in um, these sequences, um, which in our case was UAA, there's also a start codon. Um, and the start codon is AUG. Um, and so you can see that this message starts with AUG, um, which indicates that the, to the ribosome that this is where translation of an R, a messenger RNA to a protein begins. Now, in this example, I started my message with a start codon, but that won't always be the case. 
Um, and so I've got another message here, um, which I'm just going to take a minute and write down. Okay, so I now have this written down, um, and this is a longer one. Um, and so this will take a little bit more effort to decode, but this is more you know, what you might end up seeing if you're looking at, um, for example, genome sequence data. Um, the reason I say that is because this message doesn't uh, start with a codon, uh, start codon here. Um, and so the way that I would, um, the way that I would try to um, figure out what's going on here is I would start looking at the beginning of my sequence um, and I would see, okay, that's not a start codon. C, U, 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 haven't reached a start codon yet. And so I'm kind of looking base by base until I notice this codon right here. So A, U, G. Um, and that indicates that we're now at the start of our message. Um, note that there's only five bases um, before AUG in this sequence. Um, so regardless of where that AUG shows up, um, that indicates the start of the message. And that basically defines what we call the reading frame, or essentially what the codons are in this message. Um, and so this AUG defines the first codon in our message, and by proxy then, it defines what the next codons are in our message. And so if I'm trying to decode this um, in the same way that it was helpful to delineate where the codons were before, I might do something like just cross out anything that shows up before the first codon, because that's not something that's going to be useful for us to decode. And then again, delineate where the codons are. And to do that, I'm just going in multiples of three bases. Now, another thing that you'll notice here um, is when I get to the end of this, I only have two bases at the end, so I don't have a full codon at the end. Um, there may be a stop codon in here somewhere, um, but I haven't noticed that yet. I don't remember exactly what the start codons are. So what I'm hoping is that as I start decoding this message, I will hit a stop codon before I get to this partial codon at the end of the sequence. If I don't, then that means that I have an incomplete message. Um, so I only have the beginning of this sequence, but I don't have the entire protein coding region because I don't have the stop codon. But let's go ahead and start decoding this message. Um, and I'm going to do this um, a little bit more quickly this time. But what I encourage you to do is to pause the video um, and look at the genetic code and try and decode this message. Um, so I have it jotted down in my notes over here. And so um, I can do this pretty quickly now. And so what I see is I have um, the uh, amino acid met. And then it turns out that UAG is a stop codon. And so the um, protein that is encoded by this DNA here, I'm going to see if this works. Um, uh, not exactly. Let me just put that back up there. Um, but the, the, uh, the protein that is encoded by this message is met pro arg arg sear fail glue. Um, Things to keep in mind, I started decoding with the start codon. I stopped when I got to the stop codon. Um, so in this case, it did turn out that I had a complete message here. So now that we've worked through a few examples of decoding protein sequences from RNA by hand, um, let's look at how you would use a computer to do this. Uh, this is just one way you can do this. Um, and of course, the reason that you would want to do this um, or want to be able to do this is because doing this um, decoding sequences by hand doesn't scale very well.
What I mean when I say it doesn't scale very well is that if we had to do this many times, so let's say we were um, decoding a thousand sequences or 10,000 sequences, it would take us forever. Um, it would also be really error prone. Um, you know, we if um, we were trying to work through some of these sequences, um, decode them, what we would find is, you know, we would make some, some errors just because as humans, we would, at some point or another, we would just make a mistake looking something up in the table and doing the translation. Um, we also tend to get bored doing very repetitive tasks like that. And so that also is an opportunity for error to sneak in. But this is exactly the kind of thing that computers are good at. Computers are good at doing well-defined um, and even repetitive tasks very quickly. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use um, a couple of tools here. One of them is the Python programming language, and I'm going to do this in an IPython terminal. Um, IPython is just a handy way to um, interact, uh, and a handy way to interact with the Python program language in real time. Um, don't worry if you're not comfortable with this, if you can't really follow along. These are things that we'll get to later in the course, and so I'll show you how to do this on your own another time. Um, one of the things, one of the other things that I'm going to use here is a Python library called Scikit-Bio. Um, and Scikit-Bio is um, a uh, is a set of tools that are useful for doing bioinformatics in the Python programming language. And so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to import scikit-bio, which I can do with that command. That basically makes that library available to me. Um, and so one of the things that's cool in scikit-bio is um, there is a, actually I'll do this with RNA, there's an RNA object. Um, and so if I um, put a sequence in here, and I'm just gonna make this up more or less at random. Um, I can define a variable that represents some RNA sequence in here. Um, and so you can see that this is giving me some information about this sequence that I just created. Um, for example, it's um, 15 bases long. Um, it has no gaps. It has no degenerate characters. Don't worry about what those mean right now. We'll come back to those um, later in the semester. Um, and it's telling me there's a GC content of about 47% here. Um, there are some other cool things that I can do um, with scikit-bio, and so um, first thing I want to do is I'm just going to define uh, another sequence where um, let me just put a stop code on at the end there. So UCA is a stop code on. I'm not sure if I have the right reading frame, but let's just try this out and we'll see if we get an error. Um, and so what I can tell the program here is translate this sequence. And you can see that what that does is it um, gives me some other sequence as output. And so in this case, it's telling me that it's giving me a protein as output, which is six base or six amino acids long. Um, and it ends with, or that uh, sequence is MLTVHS. Um, and so now these are single letter amino acid codes as opposed to the, the three letter codes that we were looking at earlier. Um, but there's a one to one mapping between these uh, single letter codes and the three letter codes. Three letter codes tend to be used uh, more frequently just because they're more concise. Um, okay, so the next thing I'm going to do here is I'm just going to copy a much longer sequence that I have um, in another window, and I'm just going to tell Pyth IPython that I want to paste that in here. Um, and you can see it pasted a whole bunch of text there. Um, and so um, what I did was I 
um, assigned a new variable called protein to the output of calling scikit-bio.rna. So creating an RNA sequence like I did before, you can see this is much longer. Um, and then I, at the end, I'm saying that I want to translate this and that I wanted to give me an error if there's not a stop code on in there. Now this didn't give me any output, but I assigned it to a new variable and I called that variable protein. And so if I just um, type that variable name, it'll print the output for me here. Um, and this is giving me another sequence here. And so this is telling me it's a length 179 sequence. Um, doesn't have any gaps, doesn't have any degenerates. Again, not things to worry about right now. Um, I'm just trying to show you an example here of how um, I use, um, I could use Python and scikit-bio to automate an otherwise very tedious task. All right, so we just spent some time um, talking about how protein messages are encoded in uh, DNA or messenger RNA um, in biological organisms. Um, I mentioned that this is, um, we can think of this, uh, we can think of DNA as a base four system, um, but in reality, our genomes are a lot more complex um, than this. So the um, protein coding messages are relatively uh, uh, a simple encoding scheme. So we have figured out how to decode this information from our genomes, um, but our genomes are, are much more complex than this. They, they encode much more complex messages um, and we have not figured out how to decipher all of those messages yet. Um, so, you know, we can relate the way some information is stored in our genome to how information is stored in computers. But there's other layers of this that we're still in the process of trying to decipher um, and that may or may not be as you know directly relatable to how information is processed in our computer systems. Um, a good example of that is um, some information in our genomes is encoded in the structure that the genome takes. Um, and so when you have um, content, uh, very condensed regions of the genome, um, they, uh, uh, that might indicate that genes in that region should not be transcribed. Um, and when uh, regions of the genome are uh, adopting a more accessible confirmation, then those genes are transcribed. That's a layer of information that is not encoded in this base four system. Um, similarly, you know, just simply looking at these sequences, um, we're not getting information about where different splice regions are, um, where introns and exons are, um, and so this base four system doesn't necessarily capture um, uh, splice variants that we might see, just for example. Um, one other thing that is worth mentioning right now is the sequences that we have looked at have used um, only four characters, A, C, G, and T. Um, when you see uh, uh, DNA sequences or RNA sequences represented on your computer, sometimes you see other characters in there. Um, for example, the character N is often used to mean either an A, a C, a G, or a T. Um, and this is not something that is, um, this is outside of our base four system. So we couldn't encode that um, just in this base four system. Um, but importantly, it's also not something that is biologically relevant. This just is something that is used to represent um, DNA sequences on our computers. Um, it usually means that we have some ambiguity. We don't necessarily know which base is present at that position. Okay, I wanna wrap up now by talking about information as a quantifiable concept. We talked about the idea of the bit earlier in the lecture, and we, we define this as a binary digit, and that is the fundamental unit of information. Um, so just like you know we might measure mass in kilograms, we measure information content in bits. But what is information? 
um, information is technically defined as a sequence of symbols that can be interpreted as a message. And so in our examples um, that were focused on computers, we were looking at a, a sequence of symbols. So those were sequences of zeros and ones that we use the ASCII table um, to help us interpret as a message. When we were talking about biological systems, we were looking at the bases of DNA or RNA, and we were looking at, um, say, messenger RNA molecules. So we would look at the sequence of A's, C's, G's, and U's in an mRNA sequence, and we would use the genetic code to help us interpret that as a message. And the message in that case was the sequence of a protein. Um, we also talked about how many messages could be sent through these systems based on the number of places in, uh, in our, uh, or really based on the length of our sequence of symbols. Um, and so when we were looking at um, binary numbers, um, and so um, that's this up here, Um, so when we're looking at binary messages, um, there are two possible symbols. And so um, the two here is represented by the, um, uh, by the base of this exponent, which is the same across all of these. And then the number of places is represented by the exponent. And so when we have two symbols, zero and one, and one place, we can send two messages. We talked about those being, you know, maybe yes and no, or on and off, or zero and one. If we have two places, we can send four messages. If we have three places, we can send eight messages. If we have four places, we can send 16 messages. When we switched gears and started talking about uh, messages encoded in DNA, or RNA, we equated this to a base 4 system, opposed to our binary base 2 system. Um, so here, since we now have four characters um, or symbols, um, if we have one place, we can send four messages. If we have two places, we can send 16 messages. If we have three places, we can send 64 messages. And so this generalizes, I think you probably see the pattern here, but this generalizes to the following formula. Um, the number of symbols raised to the number of places equals the number of messages that you can send. Um, so now I talked about a bit as being the unit, a unit of information. And so we can quantify how many bits of information are passed in a given message. Um, and so um, if, for example, we are looking at, um, let's say our message is we just want to send one nucleotide character. Um, so we want to send one A, C, G, or a T. If we want to know how many bits, so we'll just say that this is our message. Um, and then this can be the sequence of symbols that we use to send that message. Um, if we just use one bit or one binary digit, Um, we can, um, we would have zero or one, and I'm arbitrarily assigning these here. Um, but in this case, um, we would not be able to send all four of these messages. We would only be able to send two of these messages. What if we use two bits here? So our sequence of symbols, maybe for this one, could become zero, zero, one, zero, again, arbitrarily assigning these, and one, one, 
now we can send all four of our possible messages. Um, and so we, um, in this case, we are using two bits to be able to send these messages. Um, and so the number of binary digits or bits that are used to send all of the possible messages that we want to send tells us how many bits of information we're sending um, with a given message. And so if we send one nucleotide character, that represents two bits of information that is being sent because there are uh, two binary digits that are needed to send all of the possible messages. Um, and so more generally, um, if you want to know how many bits are being sent with a given message, um, you could, and say like that we are working with um, a system that has S symbols, so like our nucleotides, there would be four symbols. Um, a hexadecimal system, we might have 16 symbols, um, but generally speaking, we have S symbols. And then the message is P places long. The way that we would solve for that, um, so we have S symbols and P places. And so if this was that previous example, we would have four symbols, A, C, G, and T, and one place long, because we were just sending one of those. And what we were trying to figure out was basically if we had just two symbols, so the binary numbers, how many places of information, or how many places would we need to send all of those messages? Um, and so if we set those equal to one another, we can um, solve for the number of bits. And so this n up here is the number of bits, um, which is telling us the uh, information content of a message. Um, if we want to get n on its own um, here so that we could solve for it, um, the way that we would um, do that, just doing a little bit of algebra here, um, would be to say that n is equal to um, log 2 sp. Um, and so note that is a, a base 2 log. Um, and so it's probably best um, to use your calculator to solve for that. Um, going back to the example I had um, over here, um, again, so um, if we were to say um, number of symbols to p places equals 2, because that is our, our two symbols in the binary system, and the number of places, um, we could end up solving for this um, as four symbols to one place equals 2 to the n. Um, in this case, we know that n would then equal 2. Um, OK, so that's where I want to wrap this lecture up. Um, and uh, the again, what we covered here um, was looking at different numerical systems and thinking about how messages are encoded in binary numbers as used by computers and relating that to how uh, messages can be encoded in DNA.